This chap here, looking very much like the cat who got the whole dairy, is Thutmose III. He was an infant of one or two years when his father Thutmose II died. Little Prince Thutmose was staggeringly too young to take the throne, and too young even for crafty advisers to manipulate for their own power, as often happens with child rulers. For the duration of his childhood, his regent – you may remember from literally the last video in this series – was his stepmother Hatshepsut. At some point around the time Thutmose was seven or eight, Hatshepsut became the pharaoh formally. Thutmose was still king as well, he wasn't usurped. Overshadowed? Yes, but understandably, given that his co-regent was both an adult and a very accomplished one. The two would, on paper, rule together, though of course Hatshepsut's coronation only served to make the existing truth official, not to substantially change anything. In time, Thutmose came of age, and while Hatshepsut worked to ensure Egypt's prosperity and favourable place on the world stage, the young king took command of the royal forces. Women did have a good deal of rights in Egypt, but many things remained out of their reach, including military service and command. It's here where I believe very strongly that not only did Hatshepsut's stabilisation and strengthening of Egypt's economy allow Thutmose to indulge his military ambitions, but the two pharaohs' unquestionable abilities in the different realms of kingship that they each favoured synergised perfectly. A lot is expected of a divine monarch. Having two, one to specialise in military affairs and conquest, and the other to focus on the domestic agenda, is probably OP and between the two of them, they transformed Egypt not only into a prosperous nation, but a regional superpower. Except, Hatshepsut's economic success and Thutmose's military success weren't quite happening at the same time. Hatshepsut would die when Thutmose was in his early twenties, not quite halfway through his own life, and before he'd begun any military campaigns of his own. From then on, until the last few years of his reign, he would rule alone, building from the foundation that Hatshepsut and her lasting bureaucratic machinery had left behind, while he embarked on territorial expansion and imperial consolidation. I've tried, and hopefully succeeded, to dispense with the idea of Hatshepsut as the wicked stepmother, and I want to dispense likewise with the idea of Thutmose III as a resentful stepson. First, Hatshepsut had her pick of men to lead the royal armies, and she chose Thutmose. If there were tension between them, why give him a means to overthrow her? Second, when Hatshepsut died, Thutmose replaced very few of her advisers, priests, and bureaucrats. In other words, the very people who'd been executing Hatshepsut's political and economic vision for Egypt. Now, yes, Hatshepsut's monuments were disfigured probably during his reign, but more than 20 years after her death, when Thutmose was approaching the end of his life and his son was co-regent. We'll get to him. I think the evidence shows us that Thutmose and Hatshepsut, who never quite ruled as equals but did rule in close harmony, were, if nothing else, allies. In the end, their mortuary temples were side by side, not a gesture made by a king resentful of the one who ruled with him. Let's talk conquest, because Thutmose was really good at it. Under Thutmose, Egyptian rule came to be extended all the way northeast to Syria and south to the Fourth Nile Cataract. He was so successful in the first of his 17 military campaigns that regions he hadn't invaded capitulated with tribute anyway, with, for example, the various noble families of Syria sending their sons to Egypt as hostages to forestall the pharaoh's wrath. Even the great Mesopotamian kings in Babylon and Assyria, whom, let's be real, Thutmose would simply not have been able to defeat in a protracted war, viewed Egypt as a military equal enough to send gifts. The military expansion of Egypt in this portion of its history was owed ironically to the Hyksos, whose overthrowing had begun the 18th dynasty. This is because the Hyksos brought chariots with them which the Egyptians imitated, improved upon, and deployed to deadly effect. We often picture chariots when we picture Egyptian warfare, but actually, to the 18th dynasty pharaohs, they were a relatively new innovation. Even so, once armed with chariots, the Egyptian armies became terrifying. For more on that and what unique things the Egyptians did to the chariot to make it so deadly, see my video about the history of the Egyptian military, linked in the description and also here. Thutmose was, like most rulers of the 18th dynasty, a prolific builder, and some of his monuments have become particularly iconic in the modern era. One, the so-called Lateran Obelisk, presently resides in Rome. 
Thutmose was also known to be personally scholarly, taking a particular interest in botany and the collection and documentation of exotic animals. Thutmose III would rule for a total of almost 54 years, though only 30 of them saw him ruling alone. In the last few years, he installed his second son Amenhotep as his co-regent, his original heir having already died. Thutmose was in his mid-50s when he passed into the Duat, which, as the British say, wasn't a bad innings, at least relative to the time. Like many other kings of this era, his body was found in the cache at Deir al-Bahri, although he was of course originally interred in the Valley of the Kings. It is now in our story that the new kingdom enters its true zenith of national strength and international prestige. In the next few videos, we'll see what they did with it all. Thanks for watching. The next few weeks will be about the 18th Dynasty Kings, right up to the beginning of the Amarna period, so I hope you have a good time. Remember to share this video with random strangers on the street or in the middle of awkward conversations with your family about their deviant politics, and be sure to tell the like button he's a good little chap who will one day grow to be a mighty king. The bureaucrats who I've left behind to execute my vision are my backers at patreon.com slash armchairegypt. Huge thanks to you all for your support. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.